events. Um, subterranean ants that form aphids inside the nest are a typical example, classic example of mutualism, in which food is exchanged for syrups. Um, here you see the first part of this exchange. And you see the root aphid feeding on the tree root, and the ant has just asked for some food, so it has to use this drop of honeydew that's really a, a drop of candy. Um, and this is the only way for these ants to get such concentrated uh, sugar. Um, so we, we are assuming that these ants are dependent on these aphids for their sugar consumption underground. Um, in exchange for this, uh, this piece of candy, the ants provide the aphids with services. Um, they provide them with hygienic services. They also provide them with active protection against predators, which can be me because uh, this happens that I flip a rock in the forest. The ants come out and pull the aphids off the of the plant and bring them deep into the nest for safety. And, and also this part of the exchange is necessary for the aphids. They cannot survive without the hygiene services and the protection of these ants. And these simple, these uh, systems of obligate mutualism where both um, parties are dependent on each other um, have posed a, a major question in, the, in evolutionary theory for, for a long time. We asked how these systems could evolve and how can they stay evolutionarily stable? And a lot of models that are out there, uh, and also um, experimental work, has focused on these systems as one-on-one -on -one interactions. One species interacting with, uh, with another species, and then the, the mechanisms that we recognize that may stabilize such interactions all revolve um, around this, um, um, and forcing this, this link between the two species. Uh, mechanisms such as partner choice, partner fidelity, ensure that time and time again these two species will engage in an interaction, resulting in a very firm link um, between the two species. However, as you already saw pop up <laughs> briefly, um, they are not the only ones. Often it's not just one ant interacting with one aphid, there will be multiple species of ants interacting with multiple species of aphids. Um, and in fact, they will not be the only organisms involved. Um, these aphids, they are feeding on particular plants. Um, so that, that might actually uh, affect um, what nutrients flow through the system. Likewise, they have their obligate endosymbionts like Buchdera. Um, and these plants and endosymbionts, they, they affect the prime commodity of this mutualism, the honeydew, which then is uh, in turn processed by a specific bacteria in the ant's gut. So really what we're looking here at is a, a complex system of interacting organisms and really maybe we're looking here at the mutualism between two microbiomes that are just hosted by ants and aphids. And in this project, I set out to um, map such a system. Um, with multiple ants, these ants keep minibugs and aphids in their nest. And then I also had a look at what bacteria plants are involved. Uh, and the two questions that I try to address here is first, what is the network structure, the core of the network? Which ants keep which aphids and minibugs inside the nest? And then secondarily, what uh, additional partners may, uh, may be involved? And then I'm also interested in seeing whether there's any kind of specificity, whether some links are more strong than other links, whether some interactions are seen more frequently. Um, I address these questions by going out in the field. Uh, flipped a lot of rocks and collected ants and aphids from the nest, over 230 ant nests. And then I combined a combination or uh, an approach of uh, morphological identification of all the insects collected and uh, complemented with barcoding efforts. I barcoded mitochondrial and nuclear DNA of all the insects involved, uh, barcoded the plant roots to see what the aphids eat, and then uh, used 6ds um, sequencing um, to get at the bacteria that were involved. So let's have a look at the results. Um, the ants, uh, this is just uh, a neighbor joining tree of a, of a subset of the of the samples uh, based on mitochondrial sequences, and you see clearly that we're dealing here with four relatively common species in the, in the system: three lazy ants and a brachymermex ant, um, and these are really the, the core of the system and the most common one. So if we start building a network, this is very, very stark for entities. Um, then the mini bugs, um, there's actually turned out that uh, there, we are dealing here with three different species, all of the genus Rhizoides, um, and they all remain hitherto undescribed. And mind you, this is just updating the 
your fish, not the tortoise. Um, so these, uh, uh, these uh, mini bugs, most of them belong to a single species, to the vast majority of them. They, in fact, have all identical uh, sequences at that uh, at that tier one locus. Um, and we find also a more rare one, the, the third species called Wake to the Right, which, um, in fact, is that rare that I found it only in a single ant nest. Now, we know what mini bugs we're dealing with. We can ask what ants do farm with these, uh, these mini bugs. It turns out that the most common ants, the three lazy species, they all tend the most common mini bugs. However, the last one I only found with a, a, with a Brachymir max. Now, this might be very exciting, highly specific interaction. It might also be a sampling effect because I only found it in this one single nest, and it happens to be a Brachymir max nest. And then we start um, building the network here. We can see that all the, the three most common ants, they are sending all the mini bugs, even though the middle one, uh, Lassius and Moratus, tends to send mini bugs a little bit more often than, than the other species. Um, and then the part of the is to decide in this little island with, uh, with that uh, uh, one mini bug. The story for the aphids is a little bit more complicated. Um, based on the first one, <coughs> formula sequencing I like did, I found at least four species in the Procyphilus uh, genus. Two, the top ones uh, are rare, and then the, the major, two major clades um, uh, are in fact the most common species, and I'll focus on that on those now. Um, and I love those with the long and the short tailed aphids because they're morphologically very distinct. And the top clade uh, has a very long sclerotized tail that you see here, and then the lower one is, uh, has a round tail. And then you see that these big clades actually fall apart in subclades, which hints that we might be dealing with the cryptic species here. Um, and to answer the question whether that is the case, we complemented the, the mitochondrial sequencing with um, sequencing of a mixture of genes. And indeed, we were able to resolve that tree based on that. Um, you see here that uh, um, the, the top clade, the long tailed aphid, in fact, uh, belongs to two species with the, the lower two subclades of, um, of the mitochondrial tree, in fact, sharing a unique sequence on the, on the nuclear gene, um, suggesting that there might have been a historical recombination, even though we assume that these aphids are uh, normally uh, asexually. Um, and then the, the lower case, we can recognize three um, aphid species here, which brings the total sum of aphid species involved in the system to at least seven. Um, and now we know that, we can ask what ants send these aphids. And again, it turns out that the most common ant species all farm the, the most common um, um, aphid species, um, showing that there's really very little specificity, at least at the core of this, uh, this network, which you, we, which you see uh, graphically right here. So all the ants pretty much send all the aphids that, uh, that are commonly around. And this brings us to, to the next part uh, of the question, which is what are the additional partners that they may modulate what interactions that we observe. Um, and perhaps even though if I, if I go out and find every combination, I might be more likely or less likely to find particular combinations when uh, different uh, partners are, uh, are around. And this brings me to the microbiome part of this, uh, of this project. Um, I set out to, to do uh, my C sequencing, and for the mini bug results, that, uh, that sufficed. Um, uh, I could show that, the, that all the mini bugs, here you see just the percentage of, of microbiome reads uh, for the mini bugs, and they are very consistent in their microbiome. They have two endosymbionts that are Candidatus stromlaria and sodalis, which are the known endosymbionts of mini bugs. They all have them in very similar uh, proportions. Uh, but they are their own. I didn't find these um, um, these bacteria anywhere else in the, in the system. Now for the aphids, I have looked sequencing the whole region of the Brugnera, um, just to get a much higher resolution. And you see again that for the mini bugs, are, I again re um, recaptured that tree that we saw in the beginning, that the mitochondrial DNA as well as the nuclear DNA, confirming that we're dealing here with, uh, with seven aphids. And, um, uh, and also showing that, uh, that this interaction is highly specialized, uh, that each aphid species has its own Bukhara strain. Um, and that, uh, that makes sense because Bukhara is perfectly sensitive to anything that uh, uh, we have known that for a very long time. Interestingly, that a subclade um, or, or one of the species 
has also an association with syringia symbiotica, which is a secondary endosymbion. And this makes you wonder whether there is some functionality in this additional symbiont. Maybe that subclade of, uh, of Procura has lost some function and syringia has to complement, and this is something that the method could have been investigating. And then last, um, the last part, of course, on the ends. For the ends, uh, we did also a mice uh, microbiome sequencing, um, and the most, uh, among all the bacteria, different bacteria that we found, uh, the most consistent and most interesting bacteria were the acetobacteria stage that uh, likely play a role in sugar processing, um, which makes sense because these ants uh, feed on honeydew. Um, and uh, these particular strains have also been described from other honeydew feeding ants all across the world. <coughs> then also Nitria spiroplasma, that can be a pathogen fungi, but it can sometimes also be a symbiote, as we heard uh, earlier this morning. And then I found Serratia bucura as well in these ants, suggesting that, uh, that they eat, uh, occasionally actually eat their, uh, their uh, um, mealybugs and their, uh, their aphids. If we look at what ants have what uh, microbiome, and here in blue is, is all the micro part of the microbiome that uh, I didn't highlight here. But you see, most importantly, that the three most common ant species all share the same three acetobacteria say, sugar processing bacteria. Um, and then occasionally we see an infection with spiroplasma, which only happens in particular nests. So if spiroplasma is there, uh, there it will be common in, among workers in, the, in a particular ant nest. Um, so if we now start summarizing uh, this all in our in our network, we see that even though the core is very um, non-specialized, very very generic, we see that in fact the mealybugs have their own bacteria specific to specific endosymbion. The the ants share three bacterial strains that, that are most common among the most common ants. And then most specifically we see down here with the aphids having their own Bukura strains and even one of the aphid species having a secondary endosymbion just in that species. Um, and that brings me to the last component of the network, uh, namely the, the plants that these aphids feed on. Now, actually it turned out they feed on trees, on tree roots, and the different major aphid clades have their own host suite, suggesting that um, um, their actually specialization and specificity happens at the base of, of this nutrient flow. And that might actually be key to understanding this network because maybe in the end it's the trees that govern what interaction can actually happen. So if I go out um, and just look at any interaction that can happen, I might see um, all combinations, just like you see here in the middle of this network. But if I look specifically at the base of an oak tree, I might only see particular interactions. So it might be ultimately the trees that go on what interaction can happen in this particular network. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, actually, I have sequenced honeydew um, also for um, the different uh, bacteria, and in fact, I didn't pick up a lot. And we have uh, shown before that the ants also eat the aphids, so it's really milk and meat. 